All right, guys, it looks like both campuses are there. Uh, we are going to pick up with the last uh, lecture that we're going to have here. It's I broke it up. It's really still part of the age of Jefferson. All I did was break the age of Jefferson into two lectures uh, because it was just a little easier that way for me to, to get that done. What we're going to look at today and probably tomorrow is the War of, Eight, or War of 1812 and the rise of a new nationalism. And then we got our exam next week, so uh, we ought to be in pretty good shape with this. Several of you have contacted me that you were going to be uh, at an FFA event of some sort on the day of the, uh, the test. If that's the case, just set it up with your proctor on your campus uh, and they, they can schedule a time for you to take the, take the test. Um, what day is uh, I've got to look at a week from, what did I say, next Monday, guys? Is that what I said, or next Wednesday? I think you said Monday. Monday, yeah, next Monday. Uh, Say it again. They want to do it Wednesday. <laughs> they, they want to do it Wednesday. Uh, are you begging? Are you begging for next Wednesday? <laughs> Let, let's see where I get today. We might we might look at that, okay? But let's see where I get today. Yeah, I see you back there. All right. She she's she's back there in the in, in just the right shirt to get that done with that that that, that one on there. I yeah, like that. Next Monday. All right. So we're going to move into <clears throat> the War of eighteen twelve a little bit. If I can get it to pull up. There we go. <coughs> and again, this is still part of the age of Jefferson. This is still part of this, uh, this time period that you can feel Thomas Jefferson all the way through. Even though Jefferson is not the president anymore, his hand chosen selector, uh, our, our uh, replacement, James Madison, is there. Kind of to get us back on, on, on where we're going. This is a re repeat of what we did the last time. Uh, but those war hawks had come to power. These young, westernized aristocrats, particularly led by Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Uh, these guys want to go to war badly. And they've got a legitimate reason to want to go to war. Let's not forget that England has been putting uh, or, or has been funneling guns to the Indians and encouraging them to attack the Western settlements. Uh, they've also been impressing soldiers from the East. So there's a lot of people that are, that are really pushing for this, mostly Southerners and Westerners. People in the North and the East are not nearly as excited about going to war because frankly, if you go to war against the greatest naval power in the world, it's going to be the people in the north and the east that are going to get hammered, okay? They know that's where the baby's going to land. Um, so this guy, Henry Clay, was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives. He was only 29 years old when he was elected Speaker of the House, the youngest man ever elected to that position. Uh, pretty impressive if you think about it. 29 years old, and he's the third most powerful person in the country. Some would argue the second. Some would argue he's even more powerful than the vice president. Um, let's look at what's going on on the Indian front during this. There's this Indian chief named Tecumseh. Tecumseh uh, is a Shawnee chief, but he has this dream. And in Tecumseh's dream, he believes that he's going to be pushing, he sees himself pushing the white man back into the sea. Literally in this dream, it's him, and he's got a white guy, and he's throwing him into the sea. Well, he goes to his brother, which we're just going to call the prophet, okay? For our purposes, his name is the prophet. He didn't go by that. He went by either Lalawastakan or Tenskawatawa. By the way, I think Lalawastakan would be a great name for a future child. Ladies, write that down, uh, just in case. What name? Lalawastakan. Uh, it literally means loudmouth. Uh, 
Um, Tenskawatawa means like crouching cat or something to that effect. But those, that, that was his real name. But everybody just called him the prophet. He was a medicine man, a shaman, uh, a religious holy man who interpreted the dream. And he told his brother that what this dream meant is that you are supposed to be the person that unites the Indian tribes, defeats the white man, and the pushing him back into the sea is returning him back to the seas where he came from. Uh, so Tecumseh ends up uniting these, these tribes. He calls it the Red Stick Confederacy. Uh, mostly Shawnee tribes, but not all. And at this point, he's not allied with either side in this upcoming war. But he tells the Americans to get out of Shawnee land. Get off that, that western part of the United States. Get out of there. Basically, it's the area around the Great Lakes. Ohio River Valley up into the Great Lakes. And he says, if you'll get off this, we can live in peace. But the Indians have this land. You can have your land. Everything will be fine. But if you don't, if you choose not to get off this land, he says the Red Sticks are going to ally with the, with the British. And there's going to be war against against the United States. We take this very seriously because we saw what happened. Teacher, sorry for interruption. Please send any seniors that need picture retakes to the new gym at this time. Thank you. We saw what happened in the French and Indian War whenever the Indians allied. It becomes a very bloody thing. We don't want to do this. Um, Tecumseh is pretty successful. There's a lot of reasons for his, his fighting. Uh, the biggest one is just philosophical. Tecumseh is from a tradition that does not believe in property ownership. They just can't comprehend the idea that man can own land. The land was provided for everyone. So if you believe that land can't be owned, then you also have to believe that all of those treaties that you had done, all those land deals that the Indians had made with the United States, they're forfeit. They don't count. They're thrown out because it's not just for man to own land. Okay. Finally, this Virginian, he was the governor of Indiana Territory by this point, a guy named William Henry Harrison. And we're going to get to know him a little better later on. William Henry Harrison is given the command to deal with the Indian threat by whatever means is necessary. So Harrison attacks Tecumseh with a thousand-man army. Now today, that wouldn't be that big. But that was a massive army at this time period. He defeats Tecumseh. Uh, Tecumseh is killed in the battle. This is called the Battle of Tippecanoe. And actually, technically, it was put in bay, which was part of the Battle of Tippecanoe. But he loses 20% of his forces. Tecumseh is defeated, but he's defeated at a very heavy cost. William Henry Harrison is one of America's new heroes, though, because he has just defeated the biggest threat that, that the United States had, this Indian alliance. I like these pictures, and I try and put them up here so we can have a... Put them, put them I have no idea. These pictures are important, I think, because our image of Indians is often wrong. If you grew up, when I grew up, your image of Indians was Tonto and the Lone Ranger. Uh, or, y'all probably don't even know what I'm talking about, but there was a commercial when I was a kid of this Indian looking over a littered field and crying. That was kind of our image of what an Indian was. And Hollywood has always kind of painted Indians as this savage. Even a noble savage, but a savage all the same. 
But look at these. If you look at that picture of Tecumseh, that's not at all what we imagine Indy to look like. He's not wearing the, the loincloth. He's not wearing the big headdress. He's not wearing any of that kind of stuff. He's wearing what is essentially a British officer's uniform coat. He's wearing something that's, that, that is a lot different. He's got that turban on his head. He looks like a military officer or a king, and that's what he was. We always use that term chief, but he was really a general and a king. Tecumseh was every bit of as, uh, as much a military leader as William Henry Harrison was. If you look at the prophet over there, or Tim Skawatawa there on the right, he has a more traditional look. Well, you would expect that. He's a religious man. Religious men tend to have a more traditional look. That's still true today. Go to church. The most conservative dressed person there is usually the pastor. Okay? So that's kind of the same concept here. All right. So I want to talk about why the War of 1812 is going to happen. It is super important. This slide is probably the most important slide on here. And if you understand this one, you understand the whole period, okay? There are only two reasons for the War of 1812. That's it. There are only two. The first reason is the Amerindian Alliance, and that just means the American Indian Alliances. The fact that Tecumseh was able to unite these Indians, and they united with the, the English, that's going to push us into the war. And the second reason is impressment. And I know a lot of us weren't here for the last lecture. This whole campus here wasn't here for the last lecture. Y'all were gone. So you might not know what impressment is. But impressment was England had this policy where if they didn't have enough people to serve in their ship, in their Navy, they could grab any member, any British citizen and force you into the Navy. And one of the ways they would do that is they would sometimes pull up next to a ship, board the ship, and just drag you off. Or more commonly, they'd show up in a, in a port town, get you drunk, and when you passed out, throw you over their shoulder and put you on the ship and leave. By the time you sobered up and woke up, you're 12 miles out to sea and good luck swimming back. Um, the British were impressing a lot of Americans, okay, illegally. So these are the only two reasons for the war. And if you can break any one of these two, you're probably going to break the war, okay? That's going to be important. That's probably going to be an essay in your next test. Why else might we have been pushed into this war? While there are only two reasons, there are other factors that are there. Like the fact that our nation was so sectionally divided. The War of 1812 ranks with the Vietnam War as one of the worst fought wars in American history. And what I mean by that is it was a war that Americans weren't behind. It was a war that the politicians pushed us into while the average American wasn't really sold on the idea. The nation is very, very divided. I would argue that we were legitimately three different nations at this time. We were a northeastern nation of shipbuilders and traders. We were a southern nation of plantation owners, and we were a western nation of agrarian farmers. We were three separate nations with three separate ideas. And the civil, <coughs> civilized, I'm losing my voice, guys, pardon me. The civilized, settled Northeast is less willing to go to war than the South and West. And again, we've been over this a few times, and I keep harping on it. But it's because they're the ones that are going to pay the price. If the British Navy is going to attack, that's where they're going to attack. <coughs> the Southerners and Westerners were very much expansionists. They want to go to war. 
with England and with the Indians. Why? Well, they want Canada. That's still English. And they want all that Indian land out west. And guys like William Henry Harrison, they want, they just want to civilize the Indians. Now, if you don't know what civilized means, technically it means uh, to adopt Western culture or to adopt city life and jobs. But that's not what he meant. When he said that he wants to civilize the Indians, he meant he wants to make them like us. He wants to make them like the Europeans, like the white man was. He wants them to adopt white customs, white religion, white clothing, uh, owning property, slavery. He wants them to, to adopt all those civilized ideas, some of which we wouldn't call civilized today. So we are very, very divided. Again, I would draw a comparison between 1812 and 1960 with, with the Vietnam War. Very, very divided. Did y'all know we invaded Canada? We don't like talking about it because they beat us, and it bothers me. Um, it's kind of like when the when a Canadian team won the uh, <clears throat> won baseball's world championship a few years ago, and I wanted to just... I thought we should have invaded after that because it's our national pastime, not theirs. But we did invade Canada at one point. And there was kind of a logic here. There were a lot of people that believed that manifest destiny, which is a term we haven't even used in here yet, but that's just the belief that the U.S. should spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific, that manifest destiny already existed and they believed that it was just a matter of time before Canada became part of the United States. And they had good logic to it. Look, we had a common history. We've both been British Empire. We spoke the same language. Most of us were the same religion, although there were those crazy French Catholics up there. Um, and a lot of Americans thought, and this was a quote, that it would be a matter of marching to defeat Canada. Now, a matter of marching. What they meant by that was they thought the Canadians were as dissatisfied with the English as we had been during our revolution. And all we would have to do is put our pretty uniforms on, march into Canada with our drums and fifes playing, playing patriotic music, and the Canadians would just welcome us in, get in line behind us, and declare themselves independent. No fighting would happen. That's what a lot of Americans believed. Well, we tried it. We got our pretty uniforms on. We marched into Canada, and they shot at us. It turns out they liked being part of the British Empire. They were not at all happy with this. We were not prepared. Our generals were, uh, were poor by this point. Our generals were almost all leftovers from the American Revolution. Well, think about that. The American Revolution was from 1776 to 1787. It's now 1812. It is 25 years after the Revolution was over. And these guys are the people that are running our, our, our military. They're too old. Sometimes they're senile, and even more important, a lot of times they're preparing to fight a war that's a generation old, and weapons have changed. Warfare has changed. I've mentioned before that I'm an old Marine. One of the, th one of the dangers that we always worried about in the Marine Corps was, are we training for the last war instead of the next war? That's what these guys were doing. They were training for the last war. Um, we had a chance. If we would have taken all of our forces and marched into Montreal all at one time and captured Montreal, we might have been able to, to win this war. But we decided to get fancy. Because remember, we didn't think there was going to be any fighting. They were just, we were just going to march in. They were going to join us. So instead, we made a three-pronged attack. We divided our army into three. Never a good idea. 
and we attacked at Detroit, at Niagara, and Lake Champlain. And we lost all three battles. We didn't have enough people. To make matters worse, Isaac Brock, a British naval commander, ended up taking over the Great Lakes. He took control of the Great Lakes from us. Uh, we had one big fortress there in what's today Michigan. Anybody want to try and say that name? I always laugh at it. Nobody? Oh, y'all are no fun. It's Fort McKillimackinac. Also, by the way, a great name for a child if y'all are looking for one. So we have Lala, Washington, Tinskawatawa, and McKillimackinac. Y'all got them all? Nobody lets me name anything at home. I wonder why. I'm expecting my grandbaby any day now, and, and, and my son won't let me name him either. So, All right. So they capture McKillimackinac. Uh, they take command of the Great Lakes. And honestly, the U.S. is in trouble. We're surrounded on the north by Canada. We can't get in the Great Lakes because the British Navy's got it. We can't control the seas because the British Navy's got that. And at this point, we still have Spain on our western coast. It's not looking good. On this map, if you look it up here, I stole this map from somewhere. So no, you can't win $100 here. I don't care what the map says. I just stole a map. But those three stars that are up there, that's the three places that we attacked, OK? And I put them up there so you can see how far apart they are. There's no way those places could reinforce each other, OK? I keep hitting that button hoping to win $100. It's not working out. We've already talked about this battle. Uh, I mentioned to you with Tecumseh earlier. But the Battle of Thames, also called the Battle of Tippecanoe, also called the Battle of Putin Bay. All three of these are different parts of the same battle. Uh, this is where William Henry Harrison ends up fighting the land battle. And he, he does a pretty good job. This is where he defeated Tecumseh that we talked about. Um, but the guy that I find in, entertaining here, interesting, is this guy, Oliver Hazard Perry. Another great name. Write that down for future children. Hazard. <laughs> Oliver Hazard Perry. I suspect that if you named your child Hazard, they would grow up to be a hazard. I, uh, little advice to you. I had a student one time that was born in a hurricane, and her mother named her after that hurricane. Don't ever do that because she grew up to act like a hurricane. And I'm not going to say her name because some of y'all know her. All right. This guy, Oliver Hazard Perry. He's kind of the father of our modern, of our new Navy, okay? John Paul Jones is the father of the American Navy and the American Revolution. But the Revolution died or ended. Most of our, most of our, our, our ships were destroyed. We got to build a new Navy. So this guy, Oliver Hazard Perry, does an interesting thing. He learned from history. He was a great student of particularly Roman history. And if you know your Roman history, the Romans were the masters of land battles, while the Carthaginians, or Phoenicians, were the masters at sea. And they were constantly fighting each other. And the way the Romans finally won the day was they captured a Phoenician ship, or a Carthaginian ship, and they took it apart to its smallest parts and figured out how to build them and reverse engineered and built themselves a whole fleet of ships on the model of the Carthaginian ship. But they added something called a boarding bridge, which was this long ramp on the front. And the reason they did this is because they knew that they weren't as good sailors as the Phoenicians, but instead of trying to sink them at sea, they would just aim their ship at it and they would run into it so that ramp, would, ramp went over the top of the other ship and their soldiers would run over the ramp and they just turn it into a land battle at sea. They'd fight with swords. Well, 
This guy, Oliver Hazard Perry, knew that story, and he captured a single British uh, ship and does the same thing. He reverse engineers it, and he builds a, a fleet of ships in the Great Lakes on the British model, but he builds them with these boarding ramps. So again, instead of uh, trying to fight the British at sea where it's hard, we would just run into them and, and turn into a land battle. And it's pretty effective. These two great victories, Oliver Hazard Perry and William Henry Harrison, re-energizes Americans. And suddenly, more Americans are supporting the war effort. Nothing wins like winning, okay? Uh, as long as you're winning, people will be behind your war effort. Back to my Dallas Cowboys metaphor, you know? Everybody loves the Cowboys when they're winning. Well, same thing here. Everybody loves your, loves your military when they're winning. These are our two heroes that we were talking about. Uh, that is William Henry Harrison on the left. There's a little later picture. That's when he runs for president later on. And on the right is Oliver Hazard Perry. Perry did not survive the War of 1812. Uh, in 1814, we have the Lake Champlain War, uh, where 10,000 British troops landed with, in, with the intention to crush the Americans there. They do not get away with it. Uh, an American named Thomas McDonough, Thomas McDonough, I can't speak well today, I apologize, ends up forcing the British into a full retreat, uh, very similar to what we saw at Breed's Hill. He waits till the last minute, orders them to reserve their shot until the last possible minute, and then open fires on them all at once, forcing them into a retreat. It's pretty effective. This is an important battle that you need to know about. Uh, the Lake Champlain battle, I don't think that's going to end up on your test, but the Battle of Washington probably will. Washington, D.C. is our brand new nation's capital. Remember, it didn't get built until Adams was president and Jefferson was the first one to be inaugurated. So we're only on our third president in D.C. We are a brand new nation. But in August of 1814, British troops land in the Chesapeake Bay. They're under the command of General Robert Ross. Robert Ross is a highly decorated Navy veteran. And they land actually in, in Maryland, near Baltimore. They end up defeating the Americans at a place called, called Bladensburg, the Battle of Bladensburg. Um, about 6,000 Americans end up fleeing from the battle, most of which fled into D.C. And the president is notified that the British are very close. President Madison does something that to me is heroic and probably a little stupid. Madison decides to personally lead troops out to inspect the damage. So he gets on a horse and he leads a battalion of, of, of American soldiers out to inspect the damage. Now, some people will say that this is the last time an American president led troops in the battle. I would say that he's not leading troops in the battle. He's leading troops to inspect. Washington was actually the last. But different historians will say different things. Uh, while he's out inspecting, he had ordered his wife, Dolly Madison, uh, by the way, you want to talk about a tough chick. Dolly Madison is awesome. Uh, she had served as first lady to Thomas Jefferson because his wife was dead. Now she's serving as first lady to uh, President James Madison. Dolly was ordered by her husband to leave, to, to flee because the British were on their way in. So when her husband left, instead of fleeing immediately, Dolly decides that she has some responsibilities. And she saves this famous painting. This is the Stuart painting of, of George Washington. And according to legend, she took a pen knife and cut it out of the frame, and rolled it up, and, and, and snuck it out of the, uh, the, out of the White House with her. Um, 
She also saves, probably saved the original copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and a bunch of silverware in China. Now, people always laugh. Why is this lady trying to save her silverware in China? Well, it turned out she sold the China to get money to buy bullets for the, uh, for the Continental Army, and she melted down the silverware to, to be bullets. So she's actually thinking about what do our troops need. Um, according to legend, Dolly Madison was exiting out the back door. Her slaves were, were ushering her out into a, into a, a, a wagon to escape as Robert Ross was coming in the front door, okay? If that's the case, this is a heroic play. And I have no reason to believe it's not the case. Um, General Robert Ross and his men come into DC and they find the nation's capital largely abandoned. The president has fled. As far as they know, Dolly has fled. Uh, they enter the White House and they find a banquet set the president was supposed to be entertaining people that night. And Robert Ross and his officers sit at the president's table and eat the president's food, drink the president's wine, and then light the White House on fire. They actually burned most of the federal buildings in D.C. Most of D.C. burned to the ground. If you ever get to go to the White House on a tour, ask to see the uh, Madison fireplace is what they call it. There's a fireplace in there that's a remnant and the brick is charred from the, from the fire that, that was on the White House. Um, and they've never repainted that spot. It's left there charred as a reminder of what the British did. Okay, kind of cool. Now when they, they burned a lot of buildings completely to the ground, they didn't damage that, the White House that much. They, they lit it on fire, but they, they, it was all very easily reparable. Uh, by the way, there is a legend that the White House was uh, was never called the White House before this. It was just the executive mansion. But they had to repaint it after this, and white was the only color of paint that the U.S. government could afford. So they painted the executive mansion white. Thus, it became the White House to cover the, the smoke damage. That may or may not be true. There's different historians that say, some say that's true, some say that that's just a myth. I don't know. Uh, I wasn't there. But it's a good story anyway. All right, so Battle of Washington. Clearly, we lost. This is a wood etching of the Battle of Washington that dates back to the time period. So you can at least see what, what people uh, believe that they were seeing. And if you look at that, that's right, up, right up over the river. You're, it's being taken from about where the Jefferson Memorial is. And all that smoke and all that fire, it's pretty bad. Next big important battle, and yes, you need to know this battle as well. It is the Battle of Baltimore. This is Fort McHenry, one of the coolest looking forts in America. America. If you ever get to go, it's worth going to see. It still stands today, historical monument. Pardon me, I just keep losing my voice. I've got to have a drink. The British are coming in, and they're attacking this fort that's essential to hold. Um, Robert Ross, again, the same guy that burned Washington, is there. And out in the harbor, and you can see the harbor from there, there is a British warship. And there's a young lawyer on board named Francis Scott Key. Francis Scott Key was negotiating with the British for a prisoner exchange. This is not uncommon in warfare. We have important prisoners, they have important prisoners, and they're negotiating for, you know, how many prisoners can I get back for this guy? But the whole night he's on this ship, he's watching this fort. And all he's watching for is the flag. And what he's expecting is the British to win the day. And he expects that as 
dawn is going to rise, he'll look out there and he'll see the British flag flying over Fort McHenry. Especially after the bombs stop going off. Well, dawn rises, the sun comes up, and he looks out and he sees that the Americans have won the day. Oh, glorious flying. The American flag is still flying. And he wrote a story about it. Now, it was originally a poem, The Star Spangled Banner. When you sing the national anthem, The Star Spangled Banner, you were literally singing about the Battle of Baltimore. Okay? Uh, when they say the rocket's red glare, bombs bursting in air, that's what was happening. The British had just invented a brand new weapon. Uh, it's called a Bangalore rocket. Now, here's the deal. They, it was more like a firework than anything else. It didn't really do a lot of damage, but it created a lot of confusion with all the lights and the noises. Uh, so when they talk rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air, that's what they're talking about. Uh, that becomes the national anthem a little later on. By the way, he didn't write it to be a song at all. Americans started singing it, and they put it on top of an old Irish drinking song called the Anachronistic Song, uh, which is a filthy, filthy song. So if you're ever in England or somewhere, I was in Gibraltar in 1992, a British colony, and I'm sitting in a bar studying. No, I wasn't studying. I was sitting in a bar, and I heard the national anthem come over, and I stood up. And then I saw these British Royal Marines begin singing the single filthiest song I've ever heard in my life. That's what the national anthem was put on top of, is this, is this other song. Look it up one day. It's called the Anachronistic Song. Um, this is going to be an important battle because Robert Ross was killed by a Marine sharpshooter, shooter, Ura. The Marine Corps uh, was, was pretty effective here. By killing Robert Ross, they stopped the battle. Because the British did not train their next in command just to take over. And if you took out a commander, you kind of handicapped the whole force. The force didn't know what to do. It retreated, and we were able to hold the fortress at Baltimore. Pretty important battle. Now to my favorite. We're going to talk about the Battle of New Orleans. And Uncle Andy, Andrew Jackson. I have to confess, I got a kind of a bromance with Andrew Jackson, okay? I like this guy. I don't always like him. I think he was crazy. He did some weird things. But anybody that kills at least three men in duels for insulting his wife sounds like a pretty good guy to me. So let's get to know this guy, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a Tennessee militia commander and he had been sent down to hold New Orleans. <clears throat> Whoever holds New Orleans controls the whole West. He doesn't have a whole lot of soldiers. He's got about 7,000 people total and that's if you combine soldiers, pirates, privateers, farmers, slaves, everybody. Seven thousand. And he's about to face off against General Sir Edward Packingham. What a great name. General Sir Edward Packingham is the king's favorite nephew. He's highly decorated. And he shows up with 60 ships loaded with cannons and guns and 11,000 battle-tested veteran soldiers. Guys have already fought in major wars against Napoleon. And Jackson has to fight these guys. Well, how do you fight a battle like this? But remember, Jackson is just a Tennessee militia. He's, 
He's a backwoods boy. But he absolutely hates the British. You ever pull out, look at your $20 bill? If you got one, you can pull it out and look at it if you want. There's a scar, there's a scar on Andrew Jackson's cheek right there. It's because when he was a boy of about six, he was struck across the face with a British officer's sword while he was trying to defend his mother when he was six. When he was six. While he was trying to defend his mother from being raped by this soldier. So he doesn't have much love for the British. Okay? He shows up and he finds all of these cotton bells. New Orleans is a cotton place, a cotton production place. And they ship cotton all over the world. And he orders these cotton bells to ring the city. So the whole port is ringed with these large bells of cotton. Why would you do that? Well, because they'll catch bullets. Okay? They, they, they're making a wall. You're making it harder. And he puts spies out and barges. He sinks barges in the Mississippi River to prevent the British from being able to to prevent the British from being able to sail up the Mississippi Delta to New Orleans. So the British are forced to uh, to drop their soldiers a few miles out of New Orleans and march in. Now if you've ever been to New Orleans, you know something about it. It's in the middle of a swamp. I love New Orleans, but it's it's swampland. So on December 23rd, 1814, the British are found. They're spotted by Jackson spies. They are seven miles from New Orleans. 11,000 of these guys. Talk about how slow they move. The battle doesn't happen until January 8th. From December 23rd to January 8th, they made it seven miles. You know, in the Marine Corps, we tried to march four miles an hour. They made it seven miles in a couple of weeks. It's tough to move in those big swamps. Think they might be tired when they get there? Oh, yeah real tired. In the meantime, the Americans have been resting every night, and they're waiting. The battle begins. The battle lasts one hour. One whole hour. And look at those numbers. The British lose 2,000 people. The Americans lose 71. Is that pretty lopsided? That's Big time lopsided. Turns out one of those 2,000 casualties was Sir Edward Packingham. And as we've seen before, when your officers collapse, everything collapses. They're forced to surrender. By the way, this is my favorite story. Out of this whole semester, my favorite story is right here. Ed, Andrew Jackson is, is, is brought the body of Edward Packingham. And they said, sir, what do we do with the general? And Jackson says that we should return it to his family. Now, do y'all remember who his family is? He's the favorite nephew of the King of England. Jackson returns it. He does it by folding the body up and shoving it in a keg of whiskey. So it won't so it'll stay preserved. And he ships it back to the king. Now, we're yet to get to my favorite part. He included a note. And some of you will find this funny and some of you won't get it. I find it hilarious. The note said, 
Herein lies Sir Edward Packingham. Return to you in better spirits than you sent him to me. I love it. I love it. Uh, apparently it was really good whiskey. Anybody that will that'll fold up a body and ship it back to the king is kind of kind of cool in my book. It turns out that this was a completely unnecessary battle. Why was it an unnecessary battle? Well, it turned out. Turned out we had already signed a peace treaty with England, but word had not gotten back yet that the peace treaty was signed. So this battle happens after the war was over. So these 2,000 people died for nothing. But Andrew Jackson becomes the most popular man in America. Here's a picture from the time period to kind of give you an idea, and you can see where they're standing behind the, uh, the cotton bells up there. All right, so the Peace of Ghent. The peace treaty is negotiated in Ghent, Belgium. I don't know why, but we met in Belgium as a neutral country. And frankly, both sides were just sick of fighting. There wasn't a clear victor. England won most of the battles. They burned our capital. But we killed a couple of their key people. And at the end of the day, we had the last big victory. But honestly, both sides just wanted to end this second American Revolution. So on December 24th, Christmas Eve of 1814, a peace treaty is signed. And we go back to what we call status quo antebellum. Make a note to yourself somewhere. Status quo antebellum just means the way it was before the war, the way it was before the war. If you want to know what it literally means, think about it. Quo means equal, status means the way things are, and then anti is before and bellum is war. So it literally means equal to the way it was before the war. What that means is when the war is over, England gave back all the land they took, we gave back all the land we took, and we just pretended like the war didn't happen. We just hit a restart button. So was this a useless war? Yeah, absolutely useless. I told you earlier about a slide that was important. That there were only two reasons for the war, Amer Indian Alliance and impressment. Well, why'd the war end? Let's look at it. Tecumseh is dead, so there's no more Indian alliances. And the second was Napoleon had been defeated and England no longer needed to impress American soldiers to fight. So the two reasons we fought didn't exist anymore. So naturally, what do you do? You stop fighting. Boy, I wish we still did that. Unfortunately, we just keep fighting now. All right, I'm going to stop there for the day. We will finish this on Wednesday, and I will answer any questions anybody has on their study guide. Between now and then, if you've got a question, question, go ahead and email me, text me. I respond pretty quick most of the time. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get going with that. And y'all try to talk me into moving the test to next Wednesday instead of Monday. If I move the test to next Wednesday, we still have to start new material Monday. Uh, is that okay with y'all? Sounds good. All right. We can move the test to next Wednesday, but we will lecture over new material Monday. I'll see you guys later. Have a good day. You too.